Hey, and welcome back to Dollars and Dragons. And today I have with me a couple of rascals, if they'd like to introduce themselves to our audience. Hi, I'm Rowan Zioli. I'm a co-founder of Rascal. My brain just jumped. I used to do a podcast for another publication I did called Tripsitter, and my brain, that's how I used to introduce myself every single time. You can keep all of this in, by the way. But yeah, my brain was like, oh yeah, I'm hosting a podcast again. <laughs> Right, but like, what do you do? That's a really big question. I don't know. I, I cover actual plays primarily, the intersection of actual play and niche culture and uh, revolutionary thought. That's what I do. Lynn's literally crying. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda Cadega. It's <laughs> gonna be a good interview. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Rascal and I'm a writer and I'm a journalist. Um, and I cover lots of stuff in tabletop and I'm trying to do more reporting and more investigations and I like indie games. And if you hear any like ripping or tearing in the background, that's my dog attacking my, uh, bagel bag from this morning. <laughs> Excellent. And, um, we have links in the description for Rascal News, rascal.news. Um, and you can do as I have done and put it on your homepage. See, see what's going on in tabletop. If you're one of those tabletop people, if you listen to this podcast, you probably should be looking at Rascal News, I think, um, because like oh. that's like what I do as well. So like obviously you want to know more about tabletop shit. So I mean like you'll get all the shit if you're on Rascal News. Like there's a lot of stuff. If you're listening to this and you're not a tabletop person, I'd be wildly impressed at how you found it. Very interested to see what you're doing here. Yeah, let me just talk about. Some of the latest stories like for instance the fact that you chose to use not just like the traditional like magic mic screenshot but like the magic mic screenshot uh from the latest one which oh, is good. arguably arguably great but at the same time real bad but <laughs> because it's so bad it's also great yes it works really well um for people wondering why magic mic is on a tabletop role-playing game journalism site uh, I played a game called Interstitial 2E where I played actually Magic, Magic Mike, or as the kids called him, Magician Michael. <laughs> That's, That's uh... his government name. <laughs> his government, government name is Magician Michael. <laughs> yeah. Magician Michael. Um, okay, well. So that's uh... why there's a screenshot of Magic Mike on the uh, the homepage. Yeah. Let's talk about... Um... Now, let's segue into serious talk. Um, serious talk, why is Rascal News? Great question. We can't do anything else, man. Because, like, Fair there's there's nothing else out there. Uh, I mean, so why is Rascal News? The, the short answer is that journalism is imploding, and there are very few outlets out there that will pay for tabletop reporting of any kind, whether that's interviews reviews critique cultural commentary there it's just there's a darth of faces out there um and we love games and we would like to be able to and the three journalists who founded rascal we would like to be able to continue to talk about games for as long as possible and we decided to band together and create our own site so we could hopefully continue to write about games and continue to explore the art form that does really expanded in the recent recent decades and brought joy to so many people, including us. And uh, for additional context that a journalist may or may not want to say uh, while recording, but I can say because I'm not a journalist, Ooh. it's because of greedy corporate fucks. Oh, mm. yes. I can, I'll say that on record too. Yeah, it is because <laughs> of greedy corporate fucks and specifically yeah. greedy venture capitalists that kind of just gobbled up media um across across the board and sort of is destroying the infrastructure and the underpinnings of the contemporary media scene in really really clear ways i think one of the um major reasons why um i'm personally excited and then well let let's let's ask you why is it important that tabletop is covered from a journalist perspective uh, I think tabletop is really important to be covered because it's such a unique medium compared to other artistic mediums. The culture surrounding it is so unique. It's like all arts is like a very vocally progressive space, but tabletop has a really unique positioning where anyone who plays tabletop games like engages in world building all the time and constantly imagines new worlds and imagines new ways that things could be. So like covering tabletop games, which are only like a 50 year old medium, 
covering actual play, which is only like a 20 year old medium and seeing how a new artistic medium is developing culturally and socially and technically in response to like the world that we are existing in. We can talk about tabletop and talk about everything else while like putting some really, really cool art in front of people who might not have been able to see it for the reasons we just said, not limited to greedy corporate fucks. Yeah, one of the things that I'm I'm really struck by um, by a a journalist website like Rascal News is that um, one of the things that really doesn't happen enough with a lot of the art that's created is that it's sort of consumed with a hobbyist mindset, which is okay, and that's like what people buy it for, right? They buy it to be entertained. But at the same time, like a lot of the stuff that's being produced is created with a um, a more artistic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you if you look at anything that Banana Chan has done, yeah, like like forgery that I'm holding in my hand right here, um, you know what I mean? Like you're you're gonna be consuming like a whole experience that is more akin to like indie films or mm -hmm. like something like the Sundance scene. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, so we, I, I think go ahead. we even covered forgery on rascal i did a review of it oh did you would you mm -hmm. would you think of it i really liked it i think that um as sort of a journaling game it's like fine but i think as a a satire of the industry and i think as like a commentary on how art eats away at people when they try to become marketers mm -hmm. it's really really fascinating i think that the ideas are very very good yeah i you know and i'm that's one of the reasons why I really like it as well, but... Um, oh my gosh, my voice. I'm losing my girl <laughs> voice. Hold on. <laughs> I so feel that. Okay, so... Um, girl, I feel that so intensely. <laughs> I didn't pay for this voice training to not use it, okay? Um, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, so... Something like forgery, and the point you just made, Lynn, about art in general and the sort of dichotomy that I have been living through as like an indie publisher has been, I want to just be in the creator studio, but at the same time, I can't afford a marketer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, who's going to do this job? I guess it's me. And then I have to mm -hmm. go out and make these Twitter threads or whatever I'm doing or run the PPC ads um, for our listeners. Paper click has those things you see on Facebook that you click on or ignore. <laughs> um, and that's uh, like it, it. It's it's a whole separate job, and it's so divorced from the actual creative process. It's its own creative process, but it's like sort of figuring out a way to package the thing that you've spent perhaps a year or two developing into one or two sentences. Which there is like some creativity to that, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want to be the person that does that to your own art. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty shitty. And like the position that artists are in in general, which I think is perfectly represented by forgery, um, is that they have to be their own marketers nowadays, especially with the amount of competition and the amount of, um, I guess, theft, um, literally the forgery that's happening with AI art generation and things like that mm -hmm. would be considered. Like if we were to look back at like the average art in tabletop that was put into books in like the 70s to the 90s, we would be like, that wouldn't even be like 25 bucks today for someone to pay for. And if we look at like the level of proficiency for these artists nowadays, um, it's just incredible what you see on like Magic the Gathering cards and like these other things that these people are like squeezing into their schedule so that they can pay rent. Mm -hmm. um, because like a Magic card, for instance, they normally, I think they're, I think the rate um, last I saw it being quoted by artists was like a thousand bucks for like a magic card. Ridiculous. And that's, and that's so like low. a week's, yeah, it's like a week's work and you, you can't line that, you can't line it up generally, right? Mm -hmm. no. So it's like you have to be sustained by these commissions that um, AI art is coming in to take away from artists. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I don't know, it's very depressing. It's very, it's, everything is very depressing right now, so. Yeah, having to be, like, having to have a part-time job for your part-time job is kind of crazy of being a marketer for the thing that you're doing as a side hustle because it's the thing that brings you joy. 
and like having to consume that and like I, I went to a, a comedy show in Brooklyn not too long ago where they said that marketing is evil storytelling <laughs> and it really feels so accurate because you're doing the real yeah. storytelling of making the art and then you're trying to go into the marketing side of doing the evil storytelling the the like reverse coin flip of what you just did what's with comedians yeah. and like being like the best social commentary of our time all the time you know well that's that's kind of what it is <laughs> yesterday as of recording this we did our april fools articles where mm -hmm. instead of like kind of going the traditional route that a lot of news sites go where they like make a big announcement that's fake or they like kind of do misinformation <laughs> which is kind yeah. of what a lot of people we were like that's not our vibe that's not what we're gonna do we're gonna like write satire we're gonna like really thoughtfully write some articles and we ended up writing um uh lynn did a discourse like if you want to start yeah. ttrpg discourse <laughs> um i did yeah, a what the funny. fuck is actual play yeah. and chase did a collection of one star reviews and mm -hmm. so, like, we're just trying to talk to all of the things that are happening through comedy. Again, like, here is all of the absurdities of this, like, super insulated, hyper-niche community that we're in that, like, we think about all the time. But when you take a step back and look at it, look at it objectively, is crazy. One of those things where it's like, if you have to tell a normal person, and again, normal air quotes, this right. is a, a bit, an audio medium, but, like, it's normal air quotes. When you have to tell someone who is not online tabletop drama and they just start staring at you like you are you've literally grown a second head maybe it's time to like touch grass pet a dog yeah. <laughs> reevaluate <laughs> like what is actually what we are actually arguing about uh but yeah, yeah it's just there's so many um little interesting like hang-ups in our community and in like various different communities that show such like an intricate web that like we are like pilled by <laughs> tabletop yeah. pilled yeah i i actually just you know going back to our therapy talk uh prior to <laughs> um i told my therapist the other day i was like i just want to be normal like i just mm -hmm. i just want to be as normal as possible i know that's not possible for me because i'm like neurodivergent i'm trans like i'm never gonna be like quote-unquote normal but like it's just, it's, it's, it strikes me so much, like, when I interact with groups that are outside of tabletop, just how fucking weird we are. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I, I interact with a lot of, like, normal type people, like, that have regular jobs and stuff, and, like, and I'm just like, wow. Yeah, I really am fucking weird. I, I think uh, being in New York all the time, like, being in Bushwick... People being weird, like, it's just normal again, so relative. Like, I will walk outside, and I will see a thousand people who look just like me, and I'm like, oh, you're all little freaks in your own ways. You have your own little weird, you're into textiles, you're into, I don't know, sculpting, you're into weird you're performance all perverts. art. You're all <laughs> exactly. perverts, every one of you. Right. You just don't, yes, like, they I just are. don't know what you're perverted about yet. Like, give me, a, <laughs> give me two minutes alone in a room with you, and I'll figure it out. Textiles, <laughs> fermenting, yeah. sourdough. Like someone out there is a sourdough <laughs> pervert. I know it. Yeah. Um, and complete. You can kiss between a cat without hitting a sourdough pervert. Taking a uh, taking a hard left turn. Um, I see that. Um, one of the things that I really like about Rascal is that um, it allows for people to have real tabletop design questions with the creators of various mediums and that's one of the things that kind of gets lost with these big corporations when they promote stuff mm -hmm. um and you might have like i i think cobalt press does a much better job of this for their stuff for instance like they'll talk to actual you know wolfgang and the designers and stuff but if you get a, something from paizo they generally just like here's the thing and then like mm -hmm. um nobody talks to the designers or why they did stuff or like what it means to them or like all that stuff like and at most, if Wizards does something, it's like, hey, here's Radiant Citadel, and it has a bunch of people of color, and, like, it doesn't talk about anything of substance about mm -hmm. that in the marketing. Um, because I think one of the real major issues with, like, um, bring in more marginalized people to be representative of both their culture or to gain a different perspective in what they're creating for the game or for the whatever they're selling you need to actually like 
introduce people to that new perspective Mm -hmm. not just throw them the new perspective and like just expect them to like it right away it's better to like actually talk to the person about why did they design it this way why what in their history and stuff are they bringing to the project i think a big thing about this is specifically going to go for actual play and less about tabletop in general but i think the thing about actual play is so much of it for so long was done without intentionality uh because like you're saying no one cared uh to think about it or listen to it but i think a really big wave that has been happening at least in this specific iteration, but I think it's been happening in tabletop for a lot longer in like the indie scene, especially with like the games that happened in the nineties is this like level of intentionality and this level of like speaking to the larger culture and like having a conversation with the way that our culture has been shifting so drastically over the last like decade or so. Uh, And yeah, you're exactly right. Like getting those voices and getting that understanding, like the art can speak for itself in a lot of ways, but understanding like the minds behind the art and the perspectives gives an insight that just the the product or the piece of work itself can't necessarily do. I think one of the most difficult things and something that I kind of have learned in talking with other um, queer creators who have had to market their own stuff is um, one of the issues in, we're going to talk about white people. Uh, we're all white here. So mm. let's talk about white people. One of the problems with white people is that they will look at something and they will say, Hey, if that's if they're cis, for instance, or they're just straight or whatever, and they're not a part of queer culture, if they see something that is created by queer people, they will not engage with it or they feel like it's not meant for them. So they'll look at something, oh, it's for queers, not for me, and then they'll move on to the next thing and they won't think about it. And the same thing can be applied to uh, something from different cultures or backgrounds or ethnicities or whatever it might be. So taking that extra effort to actually like talk to people, it's not it it doesn't like I don't know. I I feel like it's not a it's it's not a big lift, but I feel like a lot of corporations still haven't learned that. They they need to actually talk to creators and people of color and like bring them to their audience rather than just expecting um the audience to accept like these diverse perspectives and stuff um right off the bat because they're not. People only like what they have previously liked until they have more exposure and understanding um with you know, new stuff that they might be introduced to. I do think that is a big role of journalism in the space. Uh, I do think the role of journalism in a lot of ways is to provide education and to share perspectives and information that have like largely gone unnoticed. And that's another big reason like why Rascal is, is because like we are very dedicated to making sure that those perspectives get voiced and get platformed. Uh, Not necessarily uncritically, but with like a nuanced approach and understanding to like what the issues that are being tackled are. I, you you lift it. I was like, Lynn, are you you jumping in there? No, um, I think I think that's right. I think, like it's it's definitely like always been a goal of Rascal to make sure that we um, create that we like write we write articles that are reflective of the scene, even if the three Rascals, um, all of whom are white, are not reflective of the uh, diversity that exists within tabletop. Um, and that's just, you know, uh, one of the ways that we can sort of hold ourselves accountable as white people operating in a space that also holds non-white people and holds so, so many talented people of um, all, all ethnicities and races. And by, by making sure that our output focuses on... Um, a, a, diver- a diverse amount of perspectives and a diverse culture of gaming. Um, that's, you know, it's key to our success and it's key to like portraying the scene honestly and with with respect. It's really interesting that you mentioned the, uh, the that people feel like if something is like labeled queer or labeled people of color, like labeled for specific groups, that the people outside of the gr- those groups don't feel like it's for them. Because you mentioned that very, like, I think almost in those exact same terms when we were doing uh, like pro GM consulting and talking about like what that process is like. Because when mm-hmm. lab- people label their games like LGBTQ inclusive, yep. people who are not a part of the community feel like they're not allowed to go in there. And I, mm-hmm. in my interview that I did, one of the first interviews we had on Rascal with uh, Aaron Reed and Zoe Zephyr, a trans journalist and trans state senator from Minnesota, 
Uh, Aaron had a really, really interesting statement in that like art and culture reporting, like culture journalism in general, is so important because even if something's like not labeled as being specifically for a group, people can still like connect with art of all kinds. And if you suddenly come to discover that a person who is not like you has created a piece of art that you really connect with and you really love, that humanizes people of different groups and like brings groups together in a way that a lot of things can do, but art is like uniquely situated to do. And, and what I found like as a pro GM, so I've been a, just for our listeners, I've been a pro GM for two years now and I've run over 800 pro games and which is an average of like one a day uh, ish, uh, maybe plus or minus. And um, what ends up happening well, or how my over time, uh, let me start that sentence over over time, my, um, advertising has sort of shifted along the way to be more representative of what sort of audience that I wanted to encourage to join my games, right? Which is what all advertising is. It's like you're trying to attract a particular person to so create different ad campaigns for different demographics. But for something like Start Playing Games, where the hosts are um, advertisements, you really only get one advertisement per game, right? So I had a choice of like how I wanted to advertise it. And a, one of the major concerns for me when I first started to advertise that I was um, or put more prominently that I'm a, that I'm a trans woman was that I would, um, you know, get harassment. But what ended up happening was that um, I did not. I, I don't think I've like received harassment to date about that through the website. Um, people joining Ooh. my games, people, people don't join my games if they're mm -hmm. gonna harass me they just don't mm -hmm. because like they're joining a queer space and they already know that so what ended up, and what has ended up happening in my community is that like 80 to 90 percent of my players are queer mm -hmm. and which is really cool for me um but like at the same time it's one of those things where it's like i know a lot of um straight and cis presenting gms who mm -hmm. don't put anything about their um um, whether or not they're an ally or anything like that in their profile, they're the people who get the problem players, mm. um, and the people that are like dropping, you know, the 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 words, um, the particular offensive words and bigoted opinions that they have in chat casually. Um, so it's just I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like people self-select to the communities that they want to join, um, and I have found that to be um, sort of what's happened for me, and. If you are trying to build a community, I think it's helpful if you are signaling that. But at the same time, it's like, how far outside of your own community can you signal for? Like, for instance, I hesitate to put, like, I don't know, like, BIPOC friendly in my advertisement. Because then it seems like it's pandering and or it's, like, inappropriate for me to do that. Mm. I mean... I'm in a relationship with a black woman, but like, do I put that in my ads? It just feels sleazy. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, and if you're a straight person, do you put, um, you know, gay people welcome? Like that, that, mm -hmm. that I don't know. That's, that feels weird to me. Um, yeah. I think the thing that we found with Rascal specifically is like, we are very explicit about like who we want reading our stuff. Not explicitly like you are not welcome here for X, Y, Z reasons, but just like the ethos that we have in like our ethics statements and then like all of the articles that we write, we have a very clear and specific opinion about like the world. We have a position on what we think the world should be. And that's the kind of stuff that we write about. And so I think we definitely have some self-selecting of like, oh, this is engaging to a lot of people. But I think there's also a big element of positioning differently as like marketing a pro GM where you're like, Oh, I am providing a very specific service of facilitating an experience. Whereas journalism is here is the, the goings on in the world. And we're not going to, we're not going to play the like objective game of like, we don't have any opinions. We're going to both sides some things. We, we have very clear stances on how the world should be. And that comes across in the way that we write. And if people don't pay us to write that. Fortunately, we have a lot of people who are willing to pay us for the writing. And so right. leaning in towards them as opposed to like trying to pull in and be a little bit more palatable 
has been working for us thus far. Yeah, when we, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we started Rascal is because we wanted to find ways to preserve our voice and our point of view. Um, so many news sites out there lose a really intrinsic part of themselves when they ask their writers to file off their edges. And we wanted to stay sharp and we want to stay like a little pointed, right? Like we want to stay direct. We want to stay, we want to make sure that we are, you know, showcasing our own perspectives when we write, even if those are sometimes like a little thorny. That's what journalism is supposed to be, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's what it's supposed to be 100%. And yeah, I mean, like, obviously, I mean, one of the things that we are, we, we try to do in our reporting is that we take a very neutral stance when we're reporting we're, and we try to get as many facts as possible and to, to like find the perspectives that resonate with truth and find that kind of honesty within our reporting. And then we take a uh, position and we dis and we discern how to deliver that reporting in a way that is honest and true to who we are as well. But truth, yeah. truth and honesty in reporting is is always paramount. Um, and we are always open to having our positions changed. Right. Do we want to it's... talk about how toxic Twitter is? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, God, no, no, please. Um, can I just make one comment then? Yes, okay. I mean, like, okay. you can you can ask us questions. I think that, like, for the most part, my answer will probably be no comment. Okay. <laughs> I find um I have like I've been spending less time on Twitter somehow and I've been working on it. But like um That's a healthy choice. I know, and I wish I could just get off of it, but like there's no other niche for tabletop that like you can find everyone, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um But for for me, there's something psychological that is like harmful about knowing that someone has blocked you. And it's like there's something about it for me that like there's that like I have I guess I have rejection sensitivity mm. and that like even if I don't like someone seeing that they blocked me, it's just like, oh, that makes me feel bad. Like and then I think I probably deserved it. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like because that's my initial thought is like, hmm, maybe I said something that was rude to them or they just didn't want to see more of that. So they blocked me and that was good for a good choice for them. You know what I mean? Like and that's how that's the approach that I'm taking now. But well, that's like, a healthy I, approach. <laughs> hey, I didn't always have that approach, but like that's like kind of what I've evolved into is like at some point I said some shit that was probably rude or deserved that block. So I'll just keep it pushing, you know? We do love but... some self analysis. <laughs> I think I think if everyone did a lot more self analysis, the world in general would be a better place. <laughs> If some people went yeah. to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. It was a joke. I'm sorry. It was it was a joke. <laughs> An attack on me. Catching a stray. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um uh, well, I mean like I obviously have a lot of like a lot of people have blocked me um for various reasons and opinions mm -hmm. and whatever. And I'm just like, okay. The way that you just let that water flow off your back, you know, I just I I want what you have, Lynn. Also, I mean, I just... like, I'm also a, like very liberal with my block button. Like mm. with everything that's happening with uh, Gamergate two and oh, um, yeah, yeah. people going after people that I consider my friends. Um, that I've definitely like been making liberal use of the block button myself, even if it's just something like I don't know exactly what you're trying to say, but I don't like this. So right. just better to just block. Um, so I don't really take blocks as a very serious indictment of someone's judgment of your character because mm -hmm. I certainly don't have a very serious indictment or judgment of someone's character when I block. Um, and I think that it's it's one of those things where, um, oh gosh, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, wait, I got it back. Okay, here we go. Um, so basically, it's one of those things where if you continually see and you are sort of immersed in these spaces that are negative and that show these sort of like psychopathic behaviors of people even if they aren't like psychopathic themselves right like whether it's like the gamergate 2 fiasco where it's just like this behavior is straight up psychopathic or if you're on tiktok and you're scrolling and you see a lot of people mm -hmm. who are 
relating stories like the am like the am i the asshole stories right that are just like nonstop. if you continually like associate your brain space if you dedicate your brain space in any way to that sort of like negativity and those sorts of like the lack of empathy that some people can display but is put on a like a really high rate of display online you will you will destroy yourself you will destroy your sense of self you will destroy your your own empathy you will lose the ability to judge for yourself like what is real and good and empathetic and worth holding on to and for me it is really 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 important to sort of recognize like the behavior displayed online is a always a performance Mm -hmm. even if you are earnest even if you are sincere you are still performing i do it everyone does it like it's there's no exceptions (laughs) you know uh so a you have to recognize that like being online is a performance and b that being online is also not replic uh representative represent thank you rowan not directly representative of the real world and i think that it's one of those things where we just have to be like really really considerate about how much brain space we dedicate to things that are performative and not representative of the real world yeah. Even when they are good, even when they are earnest, even when they are sincere, it still really, really requires a level of like disassociating what's going on with what's real and figuring out how to balance that. Anyway, uh, I have this whole like theory about it. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, that's how I handle Twitter toxicity is just sort of recognizing that it's um, not personal because it's it's just not. It's just not. So despite you having all of these therapist qualifications, Lynn, you know that most (laughs) therapists do attend therapy themselves. (laughs) That's true. That's fun. It's true. It's true. Good for them. (laughs) God, Um, I love you so much, Lynn. I I don't understand. (laughs) What am I doing wrong? True. Actually, nothing. And I think that's what's bothering us the most is that you are maybe the most well-adjusted person here in this call. (laughs) You are the most well-adjusted trans person in this call, and we hate you, but we love you. (laughs) I'm so sorry. I we love that for you, but we hate that it's not us. (laughs) That makes sense. And I think that's actually the core of Twitter. I think that's Mm. it, right? (laughs) Yeah, that is it. Um. I did want to talk briefly about something that had been bothering me and I hadn't like really publicly discussed it or whatever, but why not on the podcast? Because it's with two people that I know, like, and trust. So, um, I, and I, and I've talked with this about like some of my trusted friends and stuff. Um, and I mean, I know I'm like both of you, but like you're not my trusted friends because we don't like talk all that much. Right. So it's totally I think everybody's on board with that. Right. Yeah. Well, I think we're um, here. But now I'm at the point where I feel like I'm ready to actually discuss it. And one of the things that I think, um, and I, and I don't, and I want to emphasize, like, I am not a victim, but I feel like I am receiving so much secondhand trauma from all of the abusers that are getting revealed, Mm. many of whom I had very, um, I would call healthy or positive working relationships with and being in the position that I'm in, in which I'm like a podcast host and like, I am like a project lead for all of these different teams and stuff like that because various people have been in connected to my business in some way, I still have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not the victim, and that in of itself is like very taxing on me because then I'm like, okay, well, I have to go and do my part to clean this up. And then if we look at like, for instance, like the the shit that Elise had to do, that's a mm-hmm. that's a ton of shit that she had to do t- in order to like clean up for this person because of all of the shit that she did that she had no part of. And it's and it's always like this. I don't know. It's like it's. It's I mean, so ex- it's it's exhausting and it really it destroys my relationship with mask presenting people like to experience that since I joined the industry these past two years 
over and over again, overwhelmingly, with mass presenting people. And it makes me feel like I can't trust anyone. Like when I'm either hiring for a team or working in a team or something like that, it makes me feel like I shouldn't get close to people or I shouldn't value people like I want to value people or love them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it makes me feel like, is any of this real? Mm -hmm. And it sucks. Yeah, it does suck. There's there's a term um, called vicarious trauma that is often used to refer to first responders where often they will attend some sort of scene, some sort of incident, and they will receive a lot of trauma just by being associated with that with that space, even if they are not necessarily viewing anything particularly traumatic. They they feel the the effects of trauma on the individuals who are traumatized, right? So there's a lot of vicarious trauma that happens within the tabletop space, I believe, because it is such a parasocial space, because it's this place where personal relationships and professional relationships are closely intertwined in a way that is, again, beneficial in some ways, but also very much like it does not allow for like a work life balance, especially when you are like creating this sort of like intricate web of friends and also coworkers and colleagues. And it's, it's very difficult to sort of disassociate the way that we view our friends and enmeshed colleagues from their actions when it's revealed that they have done harm in the community. And I think it's even harder because um, there's not really very strong accountability structures uh, in the space, especially because Twitter is not an accountability structure. Twitter is not an accountability machine. Twitter is not a community and only communities can hold people accountable and only communities can help people grow and heal. Um, and I think that that's something that is really, really hard to deal with. It's just the fact that Twitter is not a community, but it acts as a, um, you know, a like a, a community watchdog in a lot of ways, but it doesn't really ever make steps towards recovery. And I think a lot of what you're feeling, if you want me to put my non-therapized therapy hat on. I'm ready for I'm a believer in your credentials now after this conversation, <laughs> Lynn. Let's go. I mean, I think I think part of the reason that we feel so hurt and betrayed when when whenever, you know, it's whenever we see someone that we previously liked or admired or thought was respectable do this sort of harm is because we don't have any hope for our own recovery if we were to also do harm. Right. It's it's this horrible cycle of like, well, what if I do something bad? I don't even realize it. Well, I just will this happen to me too? Will I have any like recourse? Will I have any way to make myself better? Right. And it's this idea if, if there's like, if there's no way for us to improve ourselves and improve the community, then when we see people get who have harmed people get called out and taken to account, but then never able to receive accountable help, uh, it just makes us feel helpless. And it makes us it makes us feel like there's no hope for us, even if we haven't harmed anyone. It just it's just it's this horrible, like curse the carceral justice system that it traps us all. It's just it's it's just a way of like we need to be able to find a way to have hope for ourselves. And the only way that we can find a way to have hope for ourselves is to have hope for the like worst among us. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting we bring this up. I posted a blog in the Discord that is a forbidden blog that may never see the light of day, but talks exactly about this, about the way that we are all so traumatized individuals and, like, we cannot avoid harming each other. Like, to suffer is to be human. And, like, everyone will harm someone else. Depend Like, the scale may not be the same, but harm is inevitable. And working our way back from that harm and making sure the people who have been harmed are accounted for and made sure that they can recover from it, but also then ad addressing what caused us to do the harm in the first place. It's all baked into this like model of, I have to be a good person. And so if I do any kind of harm, then I'm not a good person. And that makes me a bad person. And if I'm a bad person, I'm irredeemable. 
And it's really, it just instills fear in a community because everyone is just watching out to point out someone else who's doing the bad thing. So that way eyes are off of me and people think I'm a good person for having pointed out the harm. And that kind of, like, like you said before, Lynn, watchdog behavior is important and is a good step, but it's not the end. And it's not the way that, like, communities grow and thrive and we can get out of this, because that's all based in the mindset of people exist and go to prison and has to justify why people go to prison. And we're just yeah. using that same structure with new language that has the quote-unquote right opinions. Right. Yeah. I mean, in, my, in my own personal life, uh, I am an anti-carceral advocate and I'm um, an abolitionist and I work with local prisons uh, and do some like light volunteer work um, with folks who are um, attempting to like get into prison. Basically, the uh, where I live has about a dozen prisons and jails like within an hour's drive. And Whoa. I, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, like, there's a, there's a prison, you know, like, four blocks away from my house, and then another one, you know, like, three miles down the road. Uh, but one of the things that I, that I do is I, I volunteer for this, um, comp this, like, volunteer uh, group, and what we do is we bring people from, like, the train station that's in my town, and we drive them for free, like with no questions asked to like whatever prison they, they need to go to to see their loved ones. Um, and doing so is like a radical act of like restorative uh, hope where it's just like, we want people to be better. We want these families to stay together. It, like you could still have done this like really horrible thing and you're still deserving of like having a family, having love and having community and having like a place to return to. And I think that that's something um that i've tried to internalize is that like we all deserve to have a safe place to go home to and we all deserve to like even if that's just you know in our minds and our headspace like we deserve to be able to return to a place of safety and a place of hope and a place of love and figuring out how to base our you know our revolutions base our mindsets base our companies right like to in a way to in a way that like centers this sort of like healing radical love is uh, you know key to the anti-carceral mindset and yeah. it's really really hard to do because it requires like almost a complete elimination of like i am special and therefore i deserve xyz and no one else does either yeah and and trying to figure out ways to like radically love other people is really difficult but it's yeah. also like really worth it i i, <clears throat> I want to go back to what you said rowan about like being afraid of what we might personally do i want to reveal to you both and i guess in my podcast um i am so afraid of like doing a thing in my mm -hmm. position as like a project lead and producer for a company and like i am i am so afraid of like fucking up you know what i mean um and doing something inappropriate and like the difficult thing for me and it's not an excuse but like the difficult thing for me that i recognize about my position is that i was i was in the marine corps for 13 years as a closeted trans person I'm really fucked up. Like I am genuinely just very fucked up. And um you know, being out now on HRT, I'm at the opposite side of the spectrum in which I'm like a teenage girl. <laughs> but I'm also simultaneously really fucked up. Mm -hmm. So like I have such a strange dichotomy in me in that I feel the biggest feelings in the world. And then also I have this great looming fear of doing doing harm to someone. And like I it's so exhausting just I think in, in some ways existing in this in this very online environment because of that. It's very difficult for me to 
exists because I am one of the I'm like a so I'm a millennial like Lynn. I believe we're both millennials, right? Yeah. So like we're the oldest bitches in this motherfucker. Like everybody's <laughs> a Gen Z or around here. You know what I mean? So it's like um unless you've been in the business for 30 years, you know what I mean? Like yeah. uh most of these people are Gen Zers. And there's so many communication barriers between me and most Gen Zers that I don't fully understand. And in some ways, because of both my position, normally being the person that is in a position of power paying people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is difficult for me to navigate how I should communicate with people. Because mm -hmm. I don't want people to feel as though they owe me things. But at the same time, I really want to be people's friends. I really want friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's so it's like that's like the the two things that intersect constantly for me is like I really like talking to people, which is why I have a podcast in the first place and it gives me an excuse to. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming on the podcast. <laughs> um but at the same time it's like I have difficulty figuring out like is this and we're going back to like the trauma that we all collectively feel in this industry um and in in some parts like um you know for you and me rowan a um a femme thing right like just worrying about mass presenting people you know um and it's not something that i'd previously dealt with in my life like presenting as a as a mass presenting person like i never had to worry about it i would have to deal with people who cross the line other men at the time as i viewed myself right but I never had to internalize that sort of like predation or mm -hmm. being prey to people. And I'm not a weak person. I squat almost 400 <laughs> pounds. Like I'm, I've done over 10 years of martial arts. Like I am, I'm a bad bitch. Yes, but you like are. I, <laughs> but I don't like to be viewed in that way or treated in that way. Mm -hmm by people so it's always a constant worry in the back of my mind as well i don't know i there's so much baggage i think the, it all it all ties back though to the same issues that like come with twitter that come with any system of hierarchy is like people get placed on a pedestal on a pedestal and then with that power comes the ability to do additional harm but also the like responsibility slash celebration of being put on that pedestal in the first place. There is like a dehumanization that comes when you instill an artificial hierarchy in any capacity. And tying it back a little bit, because I think that like we think about stuff like this all, or at least I think about stuff like this all the time. In Rascal, our, like, non-hierarchical power structure is really key to, like, the way that we want our company to work, but also we want things in general to work. Because you can do a lot more harm being in a position of power to someone beneath you. You can still harm someone who's on an equal playing field, but then the consequences of harming someone on an equal playing field are not unevenly distributed. Mm -hmm. And it... It all ties back to just these intersecting hierarchies of power that we collectively have to work on every single day to like unpack within ourselves and with each other. And you're right, like working in like this half social, half professional hybrid model industry makes having friendships really, really difficult. I've I've had a lot of difficulty navigating like being a journalist in the space because that adds another level of distance where you're like, oh, these people I would really love to be friends with and I think that they're like really interesting, but they also are subjects of coverage and I have to make sure that I'm maintaining some kind of professional objectivity there. And then what happens if I breach that barrier? Making sure that like there is a transparent and honest line of communication is kind of the only recourse we have to prevent these kinds of things. Making sure that we are like treating the people that we're working with and that we come in contact with as equals so that way they feel the same way about us with the knowledge that like the artificial power structures that have been imposed on us by a society that we didn't choose 
We're still understanding that those power dynamics aren't just gone because we don't want them to be there. It's a really difficult line to balance and it's messy and people end up getting hurt because that's just what the system is based on. But making sure that we're trying to do something else is all we can do. I will say that I think having a very clear and obvious system of ethics and standards for us as journalists um, definitely helps us because even if uh, we, you know, even if we break those ethics and standards and even if we do perpetrate harm um, either on purpose or accidentally, we have laid out ways for us to take accountability for it, you know, and we've laid out ways for, uh, you know, the other two co-bosses that we work with to call us in and sort of be like, okay, you you did something that like we don't agree with. We need to talk about it, and we need to figure out how to heal the harm that you have perpetrated, either on accident or on purpose. Um, luckily, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Hopefully it never will, but like it might, you know, I might fuck up. I might fuck up real bad soon. Like who knows? I'm not planning on it, but like it could <laughs> happen. Uh, yeah. So it's one of those things where we just have to create systems where we can always, again, return to a place where we feel safe. And I think yeah. if we can't find a way for us to return to a place where we feel safe, whether that's because um harm has been perpetrated in our community by another person or we have perpetrated harm on another uh we are never going to actually be able to heal from sort of the vicarious trauma of being way too too online mm -hmm. yeah when your trauma is publicly displayed for everyone that makes it a lot harder to like be able to genuinely feel it for yourself because again everything online is a performance even the pain that you're feeling like you're yeah. kind of disconnected in some capacity to that pain because you are performing it. Yeah, I think, um, and you said very online. Um, that is, I think that's one of the things that I identified recently was like one of my major issues. And it's a, I think it's an issue for most trans people, especially in today's political landscape is like, we are very online compared to most other people because we have to be, because otherwise... You know, we when we interact with the normies, um, it feels bad um, <laughs> because they, in general, um, society is not really made for trans people at this point in time. And everything about society tells us that we should not belong. So it's it's been um, kind of an exploration thing for me in the past few months to, like, sort of emphasize and <clears throat> um, prioritize um real relationships that i can have in person over uh online relationships which are kind of flighty and convenient for people so yeah, yeah. no absolutely I, i've been doing something very similar and trying to just like unplug sometimes because god you like lynn said before you just forget that the world exists you forget that there is a world outside and like there is really a safe haven for marginalized people of any intersection, of any community, to find community and networks of care online. And that's a really hard reality to, like, reckon with and reconcile. But, like, doing these in inter-community works, like, the, the mutual aid organizations that I'm a part of, or, like, the, the mutual aid that Lynn does, like, finding those communities... I have found, despite having all of the same trappings and all the same problems of online leftist spaces, it's a lot easier to reconcile and work out those problems face to face than it is in the public square. Yeah. Speaking of mutual aid, I'm going to go off on a tangent about a date I went on recently, if we care. To... Iconic. Okay, yes. Go for okay. it. So... <laughs> So, like, I'm a dating girl, right? So I've been out there dating, and um, I was like, hey, uh, I was enticed. First of all, my mistake, first one, it was on Grindr, right? And then secondly, mm, 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 <laughs> of course, mm, like, it's, you know, it's I, I know better now. It's, it's a strong fine. word. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... <laughs> a date on Grindr? No, 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 okay. no, it was it was. Hey, girl, date. whatever. <laughs> All right. Whoa, okay. No, no, let's, go, was, let's go, let's go, let's go. That's very accusatory. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But um, so we went on a date and uh, we met at a coffee shop or whatever, like it was a breakfast place. And um, uh, so they had like displayed to me like that they were a blacksmith and like they were really into like um, shield maiden esque type stuff, which I was like, OK, I need just need to make sure that they don't have a particular type of tattoo. Right. <laughs> mm, um, yeah. So I just need to double check that and then I'll be solid. Right. And then, um, you know, they're tall. They do some martial arts. And I'm like, cool. Like, I would love to talk to someone who's like within those niches and then maybe develop a relationship with them. Right. And they also like ran like a mutual aid thing for like their community and wh whatever. Right. So they sound like really they great. Sound great on paper. on paper. They sound great on paper. So I show up to the date. I sit down. And then I notice something that's like a little bit off. But then I'm like, I have to stick around to figure out as much as I can. Because, you know, I'm an interviewer. I have a lot of interview experience. I need to know what the backstory to this is. Mm -hmm. And so I have a way of making people feel comfortable enough to just share things with me. And so I was just asking this person questions and follow-ups and like, oh, they had a hard life. And like, um, you know, they used to live in freight trains, like literally like boxcar, right? They were an unhoused person, right? For a while. And then um, I was like, okay, so there's a lot going on here. Great. And then I was thinking, okay, so we need to get to what I just noticed. And then they're like um, telling me about how they run that mutual aid thing. And then also it's like, okay, so do you have like a job or like how do you pay like rent and stuff and they were like yeah i know that i just do job gigs here and there and i was like and but they hadn't told me what type of gigs so then i just immediately asked i was like so do you sell drugs and their answer wasn't yes but i didn't like the way that they reacted <laughs> because that was the yes that i needed their body language was the yes so then i was like okay we gotta we gotta keep we got to keep digging, right? Really and then more. they tell me that, then they tell me stuff like, uh, because I get into a little bit of complimentary language and I wouldn't consider it manipulation. I was just like, I was just trying to be safe. And I was like, um, you know, tell me more about like, you know, some of the places you traveled. Oh, you know, five languages? Really? Okay. You must have traveled a lot. Yes, I used to travel all the time. And I was like, okay. So, and then they started to tell me one time, I was captured by a Russian warlord. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they start to tell me I used to smuggle things into the country. And I was like, oh, oh okay. Right. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was just like sitting here. So I ate my, I ate my scramble. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, and then like the, the end of the date came, they went in for the kiss. I was like, I just like, whoosh, you know, I did. Whoosh, I did the... <laughs> the move, yeah. Yeah, I did the move. We did the hug <laughs> instead. <laughs> and, then, and then I got in my car and I was like, yep, never talk to that person again. And then yeah. I was like... And then like eight hours later, it just occurred to me. It was like an epiphany. It was like... It just fine. I cracked the case like I was <laughs> Detective Benoit. You know what I mean? Like, it just <laughs> came to me. I was like, they had meth teeth. That's what it was. And I was mm. like, it all made sense. And that's the only way any of those stories altogether made sense. It all ties together. Yeah. It's genuinely I, had no <laughs> idea where that story was going start to finish. It was like Friday. What, what journey are you taking me on? Like, where is it? It could have gone any number of directions. And I was really preparing for the worst. I was like, this is going to end so badly for Friday. Thank God she got in the card before. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> what a rush. Yeah. <laughs> that's very thrill for me yeah cause like I have kids like I have a girlfriend I don't need to be like fucking around with like some you know some drug mule that now sells pedals drugs like I just I can't be doing that you know what I mean so I'm just like <sighs> I was thinking about it and I was like maybe I could send them a nice message and I was like no I just need to block this person yeah yeah self care yeah mm -hmm. self care Self-care blocking, going full circle. Full you know? circle. Full circle. This little guy is Bromley. Oh. Another little guy. This yeah, little... This is... is that a dinosaur? What is that? Yeah, it's dinosaur? a little dragon. Oh, okay. Little... Oh. Oh. Cute. He's got little points. Very cute. Yeah. 
I will say though that um dates on Grinder have been one great date that led to a second date. One date that was the aforementioned date, and then there was another date that was a pretty good date, but they lived too far for a second date. You know what I mean? Date sandwich. It worked yeah. out well. <laughs> yeah, it was great. You know, we made out, you know. Yeah. You um, live life, you thrive. Yeah, I I so I drove her home. And her home was in the middle of the fucking woods, and it was midnight, right? So there was no lights for miles, right? And I'm on this fucking dirt road, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm dropping this chick off, and then she's telling me that she lives with three other lesbians, and they live in a log cabin in the woods. No, 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 no,